Hi, and welcome to Conversations with Des. I'm your host, Des Blanchfield. Today, I have the privilege of being joined by Alex Quash. Now, Alex is the Vice President of Network Platforms Group and the General Manager of Wireline and Core Network Division at Intel Corporation. Alex, great to see you. Welcome to the show, and thanks for making time to catch up with me. Hey, Des. Thanks for having me. Really happy to be here. Indeed. Well, now, Alex heads up Intel's 5G strategy for wireless core and a range of other things, but I wanted to focus on the wireless core, and particularly 5G. Before we start, Alex, I've got it on pretty good authority that, uh, like me, you're an avid tennis uh, player and fan, and not only that, but a uh, Rafael Nadal fan, and uh, so hopefully we'll have you here in Australia, and I'll have the opportunity to take you to the Australian Open one day. Oh, you know, I would, I would love that. Uh, Nadal has done great in Australia. Australia is such a fun tournament. It's... it's um, it's very small, it's contained, and it has a very different feel than a major tournament, and I've always looked forward to being in Melbourne. Yeah, there's something pretty special about being right on that front line of those seats, uh, or even if you're in the nosebleeds at the back, it's, it's, it's pretty special, although we do tend to get a bit roasted with the sun here. Uh, well, let's hope we have you down here one day uh, to do that, or, or uh, maybe I'll get on a clay court somewhere and uh, you can probably uh, beat me to the term. And maybe hopefully this year, right, uh, you know, in May, to see Nadal win his 13th. Wouldn't that be awesome? Well, yeah. fingers crossed that that happens, right? Now, I was wanting to uh, have a conversation about a whole range of things around the world of, I guess, wireless, particularly 5G, if that's okay. But let's just kick off maybe uh, with some sort of high-level uh, uh, positioning. I mean, as a new and emerging technology, 5G is opening up a lot of new exciting markets uh, globally, uh, certainly there in North America. Um, what can you tell us about uh, Intel's 5G strategy overall? Maybe just to start with a 30,000-foot point of view. Sure, yeah. You know, if you think of Intel and 5G, you think the infrastructure that enables 5G. So uh, a lot of times people think of 5G as a cool new handset, right? You've got handsets from Samsung, maybe from Apple coming out with 5G. Well, that's just one piece of the equation. What really makes 5G happen is the magic that you can't see. It's, it's the magic that's in the ground, that's in the infrastructure. And, in, and that's really what Intel plays. And that's where we, we work with partners like the Nokias and the Ericsson's and the Cisco's to make that infrastructure happen. So if you take just um, a, a, a slightly deeper um, cover, uh, you know, and maybe it's a 20,000 foot uh, level, um, we have building blocks, just the world class of, of uh, building block technologies from our CPU, from our, our, our processors, uh, that comes in the form of communication servers running different workloads from the edge of the network, um, located at the enterprise, um, you know, in a Fortune 1000 enterprise, to the edge of the network, to the network core, um, all the way to the data center and the public cloud, right? And, and this is really the underlying in the network infrastructure that's gonna be able to process all the bits that are coming in super fast from, from devices, from phones, ultimately from things and cars that uh, 5G is gonna enable with uh, new service models. And all this data is gonna get processed with artificial intelligence building blocks, uh, with world-class processing, storage, and networking. And Intel is essentially a major player um, in these underlying building blocks supplying the industry uh, to key players that I'm sure you hear of, you know, the Nokias, the Ericsson's, et cetera, to the service providers who are uh, offering the underlying networks to support the rollout of 5G. Indeed, and congratulations on the exciting uh, new announcement around the uh, second generation Xeon uh, scalable processor and the Atom system on chip uh, P5300. Uh, two very exciting uh, new offerings, and as you said, in the case of the uh, second generation Xeon now, you've got AI built in and a range of other capabilities to meet those market demands mm -hmm. in that core environment of data centers and, and cloud platforms. And at the outer edge, uh, you've got the new Atom uh, system on chip that could uh, do a whole range of things from just switch fabric all the way to the likes of a 5G uh, access point uh, or, or endpoint. Uh, Intel's no stranger to this space. I mean, you've been uh, driving network transformation for a decade plus, and particularly in this wireless space. I wonder if you can give us a little insight into the current state of the likes of, say, network function virtualization adoption, particularly in the wireless core, and, and give us a sense of what the consumer demand for these new services has been like. Oh, sure. Yeah. We're really excited about NFV. I mean, we started the, the whole NFV movement, um, essentially de decoupling hardware from software, um, you know, driving different levels of innovation, accelerating innovation in the marketplace. Uh, you know, back in the 2012 timeframe, 2013 timeframe at the advent of, of uh, NFV, that was slightly after the early build out of the, the first uh, LTE and the virtual Evolve Packet Core networks. Um, since then, there's been some hiccups in the industry, right? Some birthing pains, some teething pains. And then, and then really, as, we, as 4G evolved and then 5G came along, 
the transition to 5G really requires a fully virtualized, now going to cloud native network, which is very much software based and services based. And so if you look at the, the adoption of NFV uh, in of itself, there was a recent report from um, Deloro um, just this year, this is January, uh, that summarizes the crossover uh, of non-virtualized to virtualized solutions in the core network at 50% in 2020. Wow. So we're really at the crossover point uh, today, and this virtualization is going to get to over 80%. I think that they're actually looking at a 90 to 95% virtualization uh, out in 2024. So there really is, is no looking back. The industry has adopted virtualized solutions. And um, I think a lot of service providers are, are implementing a uh, cap and grow. So they cap existing legacy systems. And then all the new systems they're putting in, in light of the transition to 5G, are all virtualized you know, communication server-based solutions. Right. And what we're particularly excited about is when we you know, look back at the launch that we announced last year that you just referred to, the uh, Intel Xeon Scalable Processor, you know, that, that is the workhorse of uh, NFV. Uh, NFV was born in the core, and it continues to grow in the core. Uh, and, um, you know, within, within that movement of 50%, moving to 80 90%, uh, Intel really has the line share of the communication servers running different software workloads in the core network. And then in the radio access network, when we talk about the Atom Processor, um, in the radio access network, powering the radio access solutions, we just uh, announced that we were pulling in um, our estimate of our market segment share uh, to 40%, you know, by end of uh, 2021, uh, powering, you know, base stations from uh, different vendors around the world. Congratulations. Well, indeed. And as you said, you know, the, we've seen uh, from enterprise environments to then, I guess, the cloud world in general, that uh, this whole switch to software-defined infrastructure and software-defined networking. So it was a natural transition and an evolutionary step of the telco industry, uh, which has, I guess, longer uh, uh, term ROI windows and certainly larger sunk costs and in infrastructure, as you said, you know, cables buried in the road. Definitely. Um, but we're certainly now a long way away from uh, RJ11s being plugged in the wall and offices and RJ45s in the data center, I think. Um, in fact, so much so we're seeing a real uptick in the, uh, as an increase in, in, in rollouts and deployments of 5G core deployments in particular. Um, I wonder if you could share maybe just a some general sense of what trends you're seeing currently in the industry uh, with this whole shift to cloud native solutions and, and in particular service-based architecture design platforms that we've seen, patterns, sorry, that we've seen in other key industries, as I said, whether it's enterprise or, or the cloud world in general, that now we're seeing in the telco and the wireless space. Yeah, there's definitely a very, very strong interest uh, to moving towards cloud-native architectures. Uh, there is a challenge in that the skill set is, uh, is still needs to be upgraded from a, from a service provider perspective. Um, but if you look at the overall uh, transition to 5G networks, um, virtually all of the 5G networks that rolled out starting in 2018, you know, with SK Telecom, Verizon, AT&T, uh, to the networks that, rolled, that got rolled out in 2019, um, all these networks were rolled out with new radio base stations uh, with, with, um, that could take advantage of the new air interfaces and the new spectrum that, on, on which 5G devices, handsets in this case, are deployed, right? Um, and then the core network that actually attached to these new 5G base stations was actually the LTE core or the VEPC. So this mode of 5G rollout, network rollout, is called the NSA or non-standalone uh, rollouts. So 2018, 2019, first wave of 5G networks. And into 2020, some service providers are still rolling out 5G in an NSA mode. And then the transition from the 4G core to the 5G core happens starting in really in earnest in 2020. And so if you look at a survey done by um, IHS, uh, again, it was released in January, and very much in, in line with um, the work that we do directly with, uh, with service providers, um, it is estimated, IHS estimates that 20% uh, of all the 5G service providers that are rolling out 5G networks are actually transitioning to a new 5G core network, uh, grounds up 5G core network in 2020, and then another 47% in 2021. So uh, over 60% of the 5G standalone core networks will get rolled out over the next two years. And then with a the long tail coming in in 2022 and beyond as more and more service providers bring on their 5G networks. So 
initial networks in uh, using 5G base stations with 4G core, and then starting in 2020 with some of the leading service providers um, with a 5G standalone core uh, that, is, that is much more uh, cloud-ready, uh, cloud-native uh, architectures. So uh, vendors like um, Ericsson, Nokia, uh, Cisco are all bringing out 5G core network uh, applications and software that are, that are essentially you know, uh, cloud-native that run on uh, communication server technology, virtualized network technologies, largely powered by Intel, uh, by, by Xeon uh, scalable processors, um, and now in 2020 through you know, the, the next uh, several years. But it is estimated that from an adoption perspective, over 16, 60% over the next two years, according to IHS. Yeah, I think, as you said, there's, there's no uh, doubt whatsoever we're headed in this direction, but we're headed there at great speed. And as you've outlined, I mean, we've seen broad adoption of software-defined infrastructure and software-defined networking across the board. Um, I wonder if you could maybe give us a little more detail on, I guess, what Intel's NFE and cloud networking performance solutions uh, entail in this space. I mean, obviously, you've got the new uh, second-generation uh, Xeon scalable processor in the, in the core and data center and cloud space. You've got the Atom system, system on chip out of the edge. I wonder if you can give us a little more insight into kind of uh, some of those performance solutions and how you're addressing that market demand that you're now seeing. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of our strategies in the, in the core space is, you know, Intel doesn't provide the full solution. The, the solutions come from our partners, uh, you know, the Nokia's and the Ericsson's and the Cisco's and the ZTE's and, and, and whatnot, right? The, the major telecom equipment manufacturers. And so what we do is we, we work with them. Um, and then we also do internal um, benchmarking and understanding of what's possible on, on Intel-based communication servers. And then every, every year we roll out new processors, new generations of technologies, new processors, um, new network interface cards, look at the solution from a total platform perspective, and then contribute code into standards that we, we establish and we help drive um, so that our, our customers can take the code in an open source environment we believe in standards and open source. So they take the, 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 the uh, code contributions open source, integrate that into their own products, and then you know, sell it to, um, to the service providers. And um, every year, so let's say uh, in 2015, you know, in the early days of virtualization, uh, performance was you know, in the single digit gigabits per second on a communication server. In, in just four to five very, very short years. Um, last year, we were able to demonstrate a 200 gigabits per server um, wow. throughput for the user plane. And this year at Mobile World Congress, which didn't happen, but we're making the demonstration available via a flash demo. We were showing a 1.3 terabit uh, per second demo at Mobile World Congress. And very shortly after the demo last year, I think back in the June timeframe, Ericsson announced that they achieved 193 gigabits per second on an Intel's uh, second generation scalable Xeon processor. And then we just announced, um, as DTE just announced actually, uh, together with us, that they achieved 173 or 252 gigabits per second, depending on the processor SKU, uh, just this, this past week um, on, on Intel's uh, scalable, Xeon scalable processors as well. So we're at performance levels now um, that I would say exceed actual requirements from a service provider perspective today that would still allow service providers to grow their traffic base as their 5G network continues to grow. So these are great performance numbers, and, um, and that's really what's getting adopted by the industry, um, both from a, um, a supplier perspective as well as what's actually put in the ground uh, from a service provider perspective. Uh, and, and we work constantly to optimize the performance of these solutions. It's certainly exciting. And, you know, the numbers you're talking about, they're not stepwise improvements. I mean, they're multiple orders of magnitude of increasing performance. In fact, uh, one of your associates uh, I had on the show recently, Lynn Kompf, had a great line that uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. She said that the telcos came to Intel and said, where's our Moore's Law? It seems like you've taken Moore's Law and beaten it up very, very successfully for the mm -hmm. telco industry now. And congratulations. I wonder if I could ask you one last question before we wrap up. Um, you know, the whole challenge as we we're talking there, a thing that struck me was performance and density is a constant challenge for any service provider, as we know. We want to get more bang for our buck. We want things to go faster, and, and obviously you're addressing that. Um, there's also the, the challenge of, I guess, re getting reduced time to market and then a, a return on investment on that. Um, you've been you know, a leader in this space for, for more, than, more decades than we can remember. I wonder how you, 
I wonder if you could give us a little insight into how Intel's helping your service providers address this challenge of reduced time to market and, and gaining that ROI in a short period of time, because I think there's more and more demand for innovation and, and, and adoption of innovation, but of course that also means that people have to actually make a profit and, and, and get, drive revenue from these solutions. Yeah, I, that, that's a great question, Des. You know, if you look at um, what 5G is doing, it's actually looking to, to build out the edge of the network. Uh, so, you know, up until now, it's really been a device connecting to the network core and then to a data center that's, you know, hundreds of miles, maybe thousands of miles away or kilometers in, in, um, in other metrics. But with 5G and the promise of new services, uh, the, the latencies uh, and sometimes uh, security requirements, you know, really forced the uh, compute and the processing towards the edge of the network where it's closer to the devices. Um, whether it's a car, whether it's, uh, you know, an, an operating device for, um, for surgery in a factory or, or a handset, and you want the, the information process as close to the device as possible so that you can return whatever service you need to back to the device as quickly as possible. So the edge of the network isn't necessarily quite as kind in terms of power, in terms of space, um, as the, the network core where you have large spaces tons of power to host, you know, very, very broad and big data centers and, and, and the server farms. So at the edge of the network, which is why we built out this 1.3 terabit um, demonstration is it's in a much more dense form factor. It's in an 8U form factor that you can install at the edge of the network to provide some incredible processing um, to host these network functions um, to begin with. And then we, we work with um, the, the OEMs like HP and Dell and then, and then uh, the, the Thames like uh, Nokia and Ericsson to ensure that we have optimized solutions to be placed at the edge of the network. And then also requirements around, um, you know, earthquake proofing, uh, you know, shake and bake tests for environments that uh, are not just um, demanding in, in form factor, in power, but also in just environments. Uh, so that's, um, you know, one, one major aspect of, of um, you know, what, what Intel is doing. And then from a time to market perspective, we roll out processors um, every year that have, you know, step function improvements generation on generation. And what we do is we work with um, our solution providers, you know, the Nokia and Ericsson's to ensure that their software is optimized every time we launch a new processor so that there isn't a time lag of a year or 18 months between the time a processor launches. Um, to when uh, the application works best on that processor. So we pull in the time frame for innovation so that when we have a new platform, new capabilities from a hardware perspective, the software is already fully optimized so that service providers like the Verizons and at and 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 um, you know, the British Telecoms and the Telstras can take advantage of the latest, greatest, highest performing platforms and that are, that on which the, their so software solutions are optimized on. Indeed, and we've seen that for, for a long time in, in as far as uh, you know, Intel working from compiler level and assembler level all the way through to ensuring that data moves through pipelines as fast as possible. It's exciting now to see what you're doing around the edge space. And I think we've got a, a very exciting uh, 12 to 18 months ahead of us now, as you said, with the 5G deployments rolling out from the core to the edge. And, and as different service providers appear, as we saw with the likes of Rideshare, people hadn't really imagined that that would be a right. thing. Now we're going to see other new types of services and business models come about that you're enabling. Uh, and, and congratulations on the two new offerings, in particular the second generation uh, Xeon scalable processor and the Atom system on chip. Uh, these, I think, are going to be significant game changes and in, in everything you've baked into the DNA of them by, by just making this capability available either at the core or at the edge, now service providers can not only deploy 5G, but also their partners can then add value to that and, and beyond. And I think from a consumer's point of view, I think we've got an exciting future ahead of us. Uh, uh, probably not flying cars like the Jetsons, but certainly everything else in between. Well, Alex, it's been great to spend some time with you. Thank you so much for making time to catch up with me. And I really appreciate you sharing both uh, some insights in the technology stack, but also, I guess, industry trends on where we're going and what service providers are able to do going forward. And uh, I, I really am very excited about what you and your team are doing there at Intel and particularly uh, both in your wireline space and your, your core network division. I think uh, both are enablers of, of the future we're looking forward and uh, 5G is going to be such a game changer. Uh, I can only imagine. Be, I, I, I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait. It'll be really interesting to see how our lives get changed with 5G. And thanks Indeed. for having me.
Thanks well, thanks, Alex. Me. And uh, hopefully we'll catch you in person soon and get you on camera again uh, in real life uh, once all these events being cancelled uh, uh, don't yeah. continue to be a thing. Indeed. Indeed. And uh, hopefully you have a great rest of your day. Thanks again for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.